In class, we were discussing Mendelian genetics, and we were specifically looking at some of the crosses that Mendel did, looking at single genes in the pea plant. And in those, uh, when he studied those genes, he was looking at two alleles for each gene, and he studied monohybrid crosses and dihybrid crosses. And what we're gonna do now is extend what M Mendel did, but uh, apply the same principles that Mendel showed with his crosses with peas. So we're gonna be looking at complete, incomplete dominance, codominance, multiple alleles, and pleiotropy. So in review of what uh, Mendel showed with his crosses was something called complete dominance. In complete dominance, if you look at a heterozygote, one of the alleles determines the phenotype. And in review, we looked, for example, at crosses between pea plants. This example is a purple flowered pea plant, which is homozygous dominant. Uh, and then it was crossed to a purebred white pea plant, which was homozygous recessive. And all the offspring in the F1 were heterozygotes. They were purple though. And that was because in the heterozygote, purple is completely dominant to white. So you had two genotypes that would lead to the same phenotype, which was purple. So sometimes the interaction is not complete between two alleles. And when it is not complete, one of the results in a heterozygote is that the phenotype is in between the two phenotypes of the two alleles. And this is what is called incomplete dominance. So the heterozygote genotype has a phenotype that's in between that of the homozygous genotype of each of the individual alleles. So for example, in this case, we could take a red flower and I'm gonna change the allele symbols a little bit here because neither allele is really dominant to the other. So I'm just gonna use a C, meaning the color gene, and I'm gonna put the allele for that gene in superscript. So in this case, let's say we had, this one was purebred for the color allele, uh, for the red color allele. And we're crossing that to one, to a flower that is white. And that is purebred for the white allele. Again, the C stands for the color gene and the white that I'm putting in superscript uh, indicates that it's the white allele. Neither allele is dominant to each other. In fact, in this case, they're incompletely dominant. You can see on the figure that the phenotype of the heterozygote is pink. And that heterozygote, you would show a genotype in this example of C superscript R, C superscript W. So let me go ahead and key out our allele symbols. This is where CR is red and CW is white. And note there is no allele that results in pink. It is only this incomplete dominant interaction in the heterozygote. So let's look at a monohybrid cross using incomplete dominance. And we're gonna use an example of the flower, of flower color in snapdragons. That was the example on the previous slide. In this case, we are taking a red purebred snapdragon, a white purebred snapdragon, and the F1 generation are all heterozygous. And because it is incompletely dominant, the heterozygote has an intermediate phenotype of pink. Now this pink snapdragon is being crossed to form the F2 generation. And the heterozygote can either have the red allele or the white allele in the pollen, or in either the red allele or the white allele in the eggs. And the Punnett square here is indicating then how are all the ways that the sperm, the pollen, and the eggs can get together. And so when if you had complete dominance, what you would get is a uh, one to two to one ratio for genotype and a three to one ratio for phenotype. But now each genotype has its own phenotype. So the only way to be red is to be homozygous for the red allele, and that's one quarter 
of the uh, what, uh, probability of one quarter, uh, the probability of being pink is one half, and the probability of being white with this monohybrid cross is one quarter. So instead of having a three to one ratio in a monohybrid cross, uh, in, when it's incompletely dominant, you get a one to two to one ratio. So sometimes the phenotype of a heterozygote actually shows both the phenotypes that would be present in the homozygous genotype of each of the individual alleles. It is not between, it is actually both of them are, are being exhibited. And so uh, an example of this would be the MN blood group. And this is what is referred to as co-dominance. And again, both phenotypes are present. So the MN blood group is a blood group in which there's a particular marker on your red blood cell surface. And if you have the M allele, then uh, you would have the M marker on your red blood cells. And if you have the N allele, you would have the N marker. So let's take a look at this in a codominance relationship. So let's look at the genotypes and, uh, that would correspond to each of the following phenotypes. If you have type M blood, the only way to get that is to have uh, two alleles, uh, two M alleles. So in this case, the gene is the L gene, and we're going to use superscript like we did in the previous example. And so this would be the M allele of this gene. And if you are homozygous for the M allele of this gene, then you only make the M marker in your type M. But if you are N, that would mean you are homozygous for the N allele and you only make type N. If you are type MN, it means that you are heterozygous. You have one M allele and one N allele. So you make both markers equally. Both phenotypes are present on those red blood cells. And again, this is what we would call codominant. All right, we're gonna review these do dominance relationships by looking at Tay-Sachs disease. And we've learned about Tay-Sachs disease as a lysosomal, it's a disorder of an enzyme in the lysosome. The gene encodes an enzyme that when defective does not allow the breakdown of a lipid. And with the disease, the accumulation of that lipid, specifically in, in neurons, leads to the death of the child by, uh, by age two. So if we were to look at just the disease at the organismal level, this is, it shows complete dominance. And the reason is, is because the heterozygote, that is you have one normal, one tay sachs allele, that individual would be normal. In other words, normal is completely dominant to tay sachs But if you looked at the biochemical level, uh, and you look to see the enzyme activity, the heterozygotes actually have half the enzymatic activity as a person who is homozygous normal. So their phenotype is in between. So for example, if you were homozygous for being normal, let's say you'd have 100% enzyme activity for that particular enzyme. If you were homozygous um, Tay-Sachs, you would have 0% enzyme activity. But if you look at the heterozygote, there would be 50% enzyme activity. In other words, a phenotype between the other two. And so this would be, if you're looking at the biochemical activity, you would describe the heterozygote as showing incomplete dominance. Now, if we were to even look closer and look at the molecular level at the proteins themselves, the cells would actually contain equal amounts of the normal enzyme uh, and the defective enzyme. And so if you were just saying at the molecular level, how would you describe this? This would be codominance. So some extensions of Mendelian genetics are, for example, now incomplete dominance, codominance, and multiple alleles. And this is all involving single gene inheritance. Uh, let's take a look at multiple alleles now. 
And in the case of multiple alleles, this would be where there's more than two alleles for a given gene. We've always talked about just two, you know, green or yellow, purple or white, Tay-Sachs or normal. But in reality, most genes have more alleles than just two. And one example of this is the ABO blood group. And in this case, there are three alleles. And the three alleles are, the gene is the I gene. And this gene encodes uh, a, a, a particular carbohydrate to be put on the surface of red blood cells. And this is identified in, in your body as being self, whatever you produce. But whatever carbohydrate type you don't produce is recognized as being foreign. And so you cannot accept blood from individuals who don't have types that are compatible with your own. Now, it turns out that there are three, uh, three alleles, and these three alleles, uh, two of them are codominant. Uh, we've got the IA allele, and that is codominant to the I superscript B allele. But both of these alleles are dominant to the recessive little i allele, which is going to, uh, we'll discuss what phenotype that results in in just a moment. So in this figure, it's trying to show you that if you have the i allele for this, you would make the A type carbohydrate, which is shown as a triangle. If you have the B allele, you would make the B type carbohydrate, which is shown as a circle. But if you have the recessive little i allele, this results in no carbohydrate being put on uh, with respect to this particular. So now let's put it all together. This first figure is showing a red blood cell that has only triangles, which is supposed to show the A type carbohydrate. There are actually two genotypes that can result in this. The first genotype is homozygous for the A allele. And the second genotype would be heterozygous with little i, which is actually the O allele. So the phenotype that these two genotypes can result in is blood type A. Now the second figure here is showing a red blood cell with only the B type carbohydrate. And there are two genotypes that can lead to that. You can be homozygous for B, the B allele, or you can be heterozygous with the B allele and the little i, which is the O allele. So if you are homozygous for B or heterozygous with the B allele and O, then you are type B. All right, but if you look on this last one, what happens if you are both? Do you see how there's both B and A on the surface? Well, the only way to do that is to be heterozygous with A and the B allele because you then produce both kinds of carbohydrate modifications. So this individual would be have the phenotype of being blood type AB. The last one, if you look at this, there are no carbohydrate modifications with respect to this gene. And this can only happen if you are homozygous recessive for little i, and that will result in type O. So this is an example of multiple alleles. There are three alleles. With those three alleles, there are six possible genotypes in the population. And with those six genotypes, there are four possible phenotypes. You can either be type A blood, type B blood, type AB blood, or type O. So the final kind of single gene uh, interaction that is extending Mendelian genetics that I want to introduce to you is pleiotropy. And pleiotropy is when you have one gene that can give rise to multiple phenotypes. So for example, sickle cell disease 
are sometimes called sickle cell anemia, is a recessive human disorder. In other words, if you have one normal allele and one sickle cell allele, you are normal. The only way to get sickle cell disease is to be homozygous for the sickle cell allele. But having, being homozygous for the sickle cell allele doesn't just cause sickle cell disease. There's this variety of uh, symptomology that occurs with that. Your cells, yes, are sickled in shape, but if you look at the hemoglobin, your hemoglobin in the red blood cells is not in the proper shape. Instead of being globular, it crystallizes and becomes more fibrous. In addition, the changed nature of the red blood cells causes uh, clogged blood vessels. And the uh, reduction of the amount of red blood cells causes anemia. That's a reduction in your oxygen carrying capacity. So this is an example of pleiotropy. Again, where you have a single gene, but it can cause many or more than one phenotype. So we've been looking at interaction, uh, the interaction at a heterozygote level uh, for complete dominance, incomplete dominance, and co-dominance. What is the phenotype of the heterozygote determines that relationship? And then we talked about pleiotropy. But what if we're talking about interactions between two separate genes? And so I want to briefly introduce to you the concept of epistasis, polygenic inheritance, and a very related idea to this, which is multifactorial inheritance. So one of the gene interactions that can occur between two genes is called epistasis. And this occurs when the expression of one gene is gonna alter the expression of another gene. And so this is an example of where two genes contribute to a single phenotype. And the example that we have here is of Labrador retriever coat color. And we have two Labrador retrievers, two dogs, which have black coat color. And they are both dihybrids. Of, in this case, big B, little b, big E, little e. So the B gene, in this case, determines whether or not the color is brown or black. However, the E gene, in this case, is the epistatic gene, and it is going to determine whether or not the fur is able to be pigmented at all, whether or not it can be black or brown. If the genotype at the E gene is little e, little e, it makes it so that regardless of what there is at the B gene, that the coat will be yellow. So let's take a look at this Punnett square of this dihybrid cross and take a look at these three squares here in which the genotype at the E gene is little e, little e. And because it's little e, little e, it doesn't matter what's happening at the B gene. You can see that uh, they have big B, big B, big B, little b, and little b, little b. It doesn't matter. The coat of the Labrador Retriever is going to be yellow, unpigmented. Then if it has at least one big E, and you can see that that's what's left in all of these boxes, that there's at least one big E, that allows for the color. Uh, if you've got the, uh, at least a big B and a big E, then the color is black. And if you have little b, little b, and at least a big E, then the color is brown. So the previous example was where two genes work together and contributed towards a particular phenotype. And one of those genes had the ability to overshadow what the other gene, what the information that the other gene was giving. The, Another example of multiple genes contributing towards a phenotype is polygenic inheritance. And this is where there's an added effect of two or more genes on a single phenotype. And depending on how many genes are involved, it can really then result in a large number of phenotypes that result from the combination of the genes. And uh, this can result in what's called a continuum. Of, uh, of phenotypic, uh, a phenotypic continuum in the population. The figure here is just saying, let's say there were three genes that contributed to skin color. And each of these genes were incompletely dominant. That means that if you're heterozygous, there would be a color in between. Basically, these are now showing all the different 
amounts of pigmentation you would get depending uh, on how many of the uh, darker skin alleles you inherited in these three genes. And so if this is just with three genes contributing towards a phenotype in an additive way, imagine four or five or six. Um, an example, another example of this is height. I mean, you can line everybody up, uh, for example, in our lecture hall, and there would probably be no two people that were absolutely exactly the same height to laser measurement. So there is a huge continuum of height. But wait, you're probably saying, doesn't things like sun influence your skin color and things like nutrition influence what your final height is? And the answer to that is yes. So in addition to being polygenic inheritance in which there are multiple genes that are contributing towards a phenotype, it is also, those examples are also uh, indicate multifactorial inheritance. And this is where you're looking at the environmental influence in addition to the genetic influence on a phenotype. The example that's shown here is hydrangeas. These hydrangeas would have the same genotype, but the phenotype uh, is, is different in this case because the environment influences the color. These hydrangeas were grown in basic soil, right? In high pH soil, and that causes the pigmentation in the flowers to be pink. Whereas these hydrangeas here, it could be the same hydrangeas, the same genetic variety. It is grown in acidic soil and that causes the pigmentation in the flowers to be blue. So this is again an example of the combination of genetic makeup and the environment.